Okay, let's go through an example. This is example 11-4 from your textbook. We're told we're dealing with an SKF bearing, that's the name brand, and it's model 6210. This bearing is an angular contact bearing. Now, we're given some values for force. The axial or thrust force is 400 pounds. The radial force is actually not much larger, 500 pounds. The basic static load rating for this bearing is 4,450 pounds. And the catalog load rating, the C10 value, is 7,900 pounds. So notice something interesting here, that when the bearing is not rotating, we can't handle that much force without sustaining permanent damage. This is smaller than the C10 rating. We're told that the outer ring is stationary, or in other words, the inner ring is rotating, so that means the rotation factor is 1. And our job is to estimate the life in hours, the L10 rating in hours, at this speed of 720 RPM. There are a couple of things to point out here. So here, the L10 life, uh, this is uh, this happens to be the design life, so that simplifies the problem. Also, notice that this is not a design problem. This is an analysis problem. We are given a bearing, and we're trying to find out how long it's going to last. So, in other words, we are starting with system specifications. and we'd like to make a performance prediction. This is an analysis process. So you might ask, well, what's design? You may remember design is the inverse of analysis. So if we have desired performance for a bearing, if that's the starting point and the end point is bearing selection, then this is a design problem. In this, exa in this example, we are solving an analysis problem. So, first step, find the threshold value E. So, how do we do that? Well, first we need to know what is this ratio, axial load divided by the basic static load rating. Well, we know both of those. That's easy to calculate. So 0 0.90. So now we go to the table, table 11-1, and see where this lies. So let's have a look here. It goes in between these two rows, 0 0.084 and 0 0.110. So because we don't land exactly on one of those, we're going to have to do some interpolation. We know E is going to be somewhere between 0.28 and 0.3. And then we're going to have to interpolate either for x1 and y1 or for x2 and y2. Actually, x1 and y1, that's only the case where we are less than the threshold value of E. And if that's the case, then we really don't need to do any, any interpolation because the equivalent radial load is equal to the uh, radial load. So if we are above the threshold value of E, however, we do need to interpolate also for the value of Y2. So let's have a look at how to do this interpolation. 
let's say the vertical axis corresponds to E and the horizontal axis corresponds to this ratio. And going by those rows or going by those rows in table 11-1, 0 0.090 lies between the values 0 0.084 and 0 0.110. So it's probably right about there. 0 0.090. And then if we're interpolating for E, remember 0 0.084 that corresponds to 0.28. So 0 0.084 that corresponds to 0 0.28. And then 0 0.110 that corresponds to 0.3. So 0 0.110, that corresponds to 0 0.3. So if we assume that a line is a good approximation of the function we're trying to approximate here, then we can do simple lin linear interpolation to come up with an estimate for the value of E based on this ratio of axial force to basic static load rating. So the basic idea here is with linear interpolation, we just draw a line and intersect with the line that connects these two data points and then see what value of E that corresponds to. So if we go through the calculations, it turns out it is 0.285, closer to 0.28 than to 0.3. Now you might not be quite sure how to go through those calculations or maybe it's been a little while and so I'm going to write out what the general formula is for linear interpolation. So you might remember the point slope formula for a line y equals mx plus b. So this is a formula that we can use to represent this line right here and we want to figure out well if we're at this point right here what is the value over here? So that, that's where this, this formula comes in. So using that form, we can write this out. y is equal to y1, and so I'm going to label this 0.28 value corresponds to y1, and this 0.084 value that corresponds to x1. So it's the first data point on the x-axis, and then here y1 is the first data point on the y-axis, second data point on the x-axis, x-axis, horizontal axis is x2, second data point on the y-axis, vertical axis is y2. So a value of y for a given point along this line is going to be equal to y1 plus y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 times x minus x1. So it's pretty clear that this value is the slope of the line. It's the rise, y2 minus y1, divided by the run x2 minus x1. And then we multiply it uh, by this term, and this is essentially just a horizontal shift. This term is 0 if we're at x1. And then if we're at x2, this term is equal to the distance between x1 and x2. So if we plug in these numbers, then we get the 0.285 value for E. So remember the rule here, if the normalized axial force is less than E, then we simply just set the equivalent radial load equal to the radial load. But if this is not the case, then we have a little bit more work to do. So here, this ratio, this normalized axial load, 
is equal to 400 divided by 1 V times 500 or 0 0.8. That is substantially bigger than 0 0.285. So that means we actually have to go through and use the formula to figure out what the equivalent radial load is. So in other words, pulling this figure back up, we are on the right hand side of E somewhere and we need to use this formula to figure out where on this line we are and then we can get the equivalent radial load. Alright, so from the table we can see that x2 in all cases is 0.56. Just going back to the table here. Since we're above the threshold value we're dealing with x2 and y2, the x2 value is 0.56. In any case, we need to find out what the y2 value is. And again, because our ratio of axial to basic static load rating, axial force to basic static load rating is between these two rows, we have to do some interpolation. We're already interpolated for E. Now we need to interpolate for Y2. It's going to be somewhere between 1.45 and 1.55. So if we go through and use the interpolation formula again, Y2 is equal to 1.527. And then the equivalent radial load, that's going to be equal to x2 times v times the radial force plus y2 times the axial or thrust force. Remember v is equal to 1 in this case. Put the numbers in 0.56 times 500 plus 1.527 coming from this interpolation times 400 is equal to 890.8 pounds. Okay, that's really just the first step. Second step is we want to know what the design life is in hours. So remember, our design life is actually equal to the L10 life in hours. And then our design load is equal to the equivalent radial force, which we just calculated, which is about 891 pounds. And we're also told that the rotational speed is 720 rotations per minute. So if we go back to equation 11-3 for C10. Now this is the simpler formula. formula. Remember here we were told that reli reliability can remain at 90 percent and if that's the case we don't have to worry about the variable distribution. If we did have to change reliability then we would need to go for the more complicated formula. So in this case we, the simpler formula for the C10 value is equal to the design load times design life in hours times speed times 60 divided by L10 all to the power of 1 over a. Now we're not solving for the load rating. We were asked to find what is the design life in hours. So we need to do a little bit of rearranging here and solve for the design life in hours. So if we raise everything to the power of a we get this. If we solve for design life in hours, we get this. Now we put the numbers in and see what happens. Now remember, we already know what the basic static load rating is. This is an analysis problem. We have a given bearing, we know the system specifications, and we're trying to get a performance prediction. In this case, we want to predict what the design life in hours is. So, of course, we have to raise to the power of A. And if we calculate that out, it's 16,150 hours. 
Okay. So that's the last example I wanted to go through. This covers the majority of the material for our section on bearings. We may cover some more in class and it'll be an opportunity to go through some more examples and for you to ask some more questions. So today we reviewed bearing types. You should be familiar with the major types of bearings and the differences and why we might use one bearing over another. We discussed different modes of bearing failure. We learned how to convert from design specifications to catalog specifications using some important relationships between life, load, and reliability. Finally, in this last example, we learned how to account for thrust loads. Okay, thank you very much. This concludes this lecture.